Hi, welcome back to part four of my series of tips for Think Tank Online's foundation term final. In this one, I'm going to go over lighting in V-Ray, the different types of lights and their parameters, and how to use those things to light your scenes. All right, I wanna talk about the lights that we have available to us in V-Ray, the different types, and then also their parameters and what those parameters relate to in the real world. So if we were working with like physical lights within a studio, what would these parameters be adjusting or what are they emulating? For me, with anything in CG, it's really important to understand how those things are working kind of at a base level, because I feel like then I'm able to make better choices instead of just kind of guessing, right? I like to understand like, why does the light look more intense when I make it larger? Those sort of things. So light types and how we access them. So you can obviously go to the V-Ray shelf and then you have your lights available right here. You can also go to the V-Ray menu, open this up, and then you have lights and your various type of lights here. In reality, you're probably only going to use two types of lights, maybe, maybe three. It really depends on your needs, uh, but you can, achieve pretty much anything with just the standard rectangle light. And that would be this guy here. We also have the dome light that you're probably familiar with. I'm sure you remember this from the look dev class, setting up the look dev stage. I think we may have also played around with the light sphere, uh, which is essentially just a rectangle light. All the parameters are the same. It's just spherical. So it's kind of more like a light bulb shape the mesh light where you can convert a mesh to a light emitting object. This guy is fun. So in here, they call it the light IES. I don't know if that's changed. It's a photometric light. These are really handy if you're doing like architectural visualization or you have an interior scene where you're trying to match a specific light type because they accept an IES file. Um, that is, let's go over here the Illuminating Engineering Society. And what they do is they catalog all of the different types of light bulbs from all the different manufacturers, <laughs> you know, and they have the specific like number that goes with them, the catalog. So you can search these, you can go into manufacturer and find basically anything here. And the specifications, the shape and different features of that light are baked right into that data file, and you can load that into V-Ray. And we can take a look at that right now. So I have one that's already here. And the file that I've loaded in, uh, I don't remember what type of light this was, but it's kind of like a recessed lighting type situation. So it has kind of a spotlight feel. We can take a look at what that looks like. So you see, it's giving us this kind of nice fall off effect. It's a little sharp. We'll take a look later at how some of these settings are a bit different from the standard light, but for the most part, it works the same. And when you add a new one, it's just this little cube. So it looks like this at first, when you load the file in, the shape will change, but then you can also go down here into light shape. And so by default, it'll change the shape based on the file that you've loaded in, but you can change it to like a point, rectangle, circular, sphere. And depending on the dimensions that you put in for it, if we go back to the other one. If I were to change this one from IES back to like rectangular, right? So it's going to put in different dimensions based on the file. So that can be a good way to kind of alter what the light is giving you. It doesn't do much for us here. So this is another tool that's available to you if you want to be really specific with your type of lighting. All right, so let's look at our standard rectangle light and the options that we have here. So easiest one, enabled or disabled with the little checkbox. This is basically the same as like hiding the light, but it will stay 
in the scene. So you can go back and select it, but you see how the color has changed. Now it's not kind of a bright red, it's kind of like a dull red, almost like a burgundy. And that's just showing you that that light is disabled. Now if we click off, you see it's bright red. So we know that that one is working. So that's a good way to work with it if you want to disable specific lights without hiding them like I do. It's just easier for me to go into the outliner. Here in color mode, you can use color or temperature. So if you're familiar with color temperatures, you can put them in here. It's going to be a little more natural, but you are limited in what you can do. So 6500 is your sunlight, really close to white. It's like a very, very pale blue. If we go down to 3500, say we're going to get something more that kind of like amber. This is more of our like incandescent lighting. So these can be really good if you want to dial in a specific value, like you know the type of light that you're working with. It won't do you a whole lot of good if you're not using an interior scene. But if you're more comfortable working in this way, that's available to you. Color gives us a little more flexibility. So this is great if you have colored light in the scene, like an accent light or something. It emulates kind of putting a gel over your light. So if you're not familiar with what gels are, they're just colored sheets of cellophane that are put in front of the light to color it. So if you have like any accent lights in the scene or you have lighting from an unnatural source, this is a good option to like match the color. The intensity multiplier. It's exactly what it sounds like. It just controls the intensity of the light. But there are a few factors that also contribute to the intensity of the light. So this isn't great on its own. We kind of have to look at everything as a whole. But you can see we can put this down. Let's say we put this down to 10. It's going to get darker. Put this up to 100. It's not too bad, really. And this is probably because of the size of the light and how close it is to the subject. We could even put in a really high value and blow that out. So here we have a really hard light. And I want to just like take a mental snapshot of this because we're going to do a comparison with something. So let's put this back to our regular one and we'll come back to that. Units, it uses just default. I don't know that they've specified what the measurement is on that, but this is just a really artistic way of working with the light. If you want to be really, really specific and you're used to working with lumens or watts or uh, one of these, which are like compound systems, then you can do those as well. Shape type is going to control the shape of the light. Rectangles for me are easier to work with when you need to direct the light. Discs are good for a more natural looking light. So a lot of times if you're doing like character work and you want a round reflection in the eye, you're going to go for a disc shape. Also, if you're going to see the light on the ground, if you're doing something really directional and you want that round spotlight look, disc is great. They just kind of serve different purposes. The size, so we can use our scale tools, like scale the light. So we can do all that, but you can also adjust it using the U and V scale. And what this does for us is it kind of bakes that into the light itself. So now if we were to go and resize it, it's going to maintain that aspect ratio, which we can also do just like manually, right? But this is another way of controlling that. Directionality. Okay, so this is an important one. When we talk about directionality, what this is doing, a lot of times you'll hear me refer to it as barn doors because that's kind of what it's emulating. 
if you've ever been in like a stage production, you've probably seen these. There are these just little shutters that attach to the front of a light to direct the light source more into a directional beam. So anytime you're working with light, the light spills out at 180 degrees, sometimes more. So that can increase depending on the shape of like the light itself. And what we want to do a lot of the time is make sure we don't have all that light spilling into the space. We really want to control it and how much is bouncing from different areas. And you would do it in this way, one of the many ways that you do it. And I want us to take a look at that. So first, when we turn up this directional guy, you'll see, there we go, we have the barn doors coming in. So we're creating that kind of like square shape. And we can really direct it until it's just like a really pointed beam of light. I want to take that back because I want us to look at what happens to the quality of the light when we increase the directionality. So I'm going to put this up to 20%. Let's go up to about 50. About 75. And then 100% fully directional. So what did you notice when this happened? The intensity of the light, right, as we make it more directional, is getting higher. And you might be saying, well, why is that? It doesn't make a lot of sense, right? The intensity of the light itself isn't changing. It's because of the way light behaves, right? Like I was talking about with light going off in all directions, it's the same amount of light but instead of being spread out over a wide area, it's all being directed forward. So the amount of light is the same. It's just going very directional. It's similar to how, like when you shine light through a magnifying glass and it concentrates all of the beams into a single point, right? And then it also increases the UV radiation. So then you get those like, little sociopath kids, right? They're like burning ants and stuff with it or setting fires. <laughs> you think we've all tried that though? <laughs> but it's a similar concept. And all light modifiers work in a similar way in controlling the directionality of the light, kind of like reining the light in, but the shape of them gives them all kind of different qualities. So some others would be like soft boxes. These are also a type of directional light, but we'll come back to those umbrellas. All of these have a more parabolic shape and that affects the quality of the light. Beauty dishes. So any kind of dish shaped modifier has a different quality. Magnums. The snoot, which is like my favorite. <laughs> it's like this tiny little spotlight. And then you have like a theatrical spotlight as well that uses barn doors. These are interesting because it's a combination of intensity and directionality that make them so strong. So all of these things are essentially doing the same thing. They're shaping the light and directing the light, which changes how we see the intensity. And then when we're working with this directionality, we can change the directional preview length as well. This has no effect on anything. It's just for us to visualize. And you have some options. So the directional preview is by default set to selected. So when we deselect, you don't see it. You can have it as always or never. So selected or no, you won't see it. Okay. So what does directionality do for us? Like I was saying, it controls the light. So it can control the intensity of the light, but it also, as you can see, kind of cuts it away from areas where we don't want the light going. So you can get really fine control. Let's see, textures. I have some lights set up for this to use a rectangle texture, and I'm gonna show you this in the context of 
kind of another modifier. So I want to come back to this one. Under options, these are very important. You have double sided, which I'm going to activate our little rim light over here. So I have this rim light in the scene and you can see if we go into the render cam, what that's doing, that's just putting some separation between the background, kind of defining the edge of the form a little bit. This is a very common setup. And this guy right now is visible. So we turn invisible on, that's going to hide it in our render, but all the lighting is going to stay active. We also have double sided. So it does exactly what it sounds like. It just emits light from both sides of the plane. This is really good if you have something like like strip lighting, right? Some kind of interior lighting where it's going to create this little shadow behind itself, but emit light on both sides. This is very useful. Occluding other lights, same thing. It's treating the light source as kind of like a physical light. So it will interfere with the rays of light from other lights if they overlap each other. These ones can be very important to affect diffuse specular reflections and atmospherics. So we can switch these on or off to add some more control to what the light is doing. So I'm gonna, going to <laughs> select our key light again, as this is going to give us a better example of this. So if we turn off Effect Diffuse, you'll see it's no longer affecting the diffuse of the object. Still affecting the specular and the reflections, but we're not seeing it in the diffuse channel. We can turn off Specular. So in this sense, it will only affect the diffuse, but we're not going to get specular reflections on the surface. That can be helpful if you need to just generally bring up the value of everything without getting too much reflectivity. And then of course we have reflections and atmospherics, which are going to be kind of more specialty cases, depending on what you have in your scene. We also have these multipliers that you can use to really dial in the contribution. So if you want to have this light, like contribute more to specular, right? You can increase that. Diffuse is gonna be the easiest for us to see right now. So if we crank this up, you'll see it just, makes everything brighter because the diffuse channel is receiving more of the light. So that's another tool you can use to really dial in the control of the light. I'm going to hop back to our rim light as we go to shadows. So here, so if we turn off shadows, now you see that this light casts no shadows. It's still lighting the surface. But this is really useful for situations like this, where you need a light just for something specific, right? To bring out kind of the edge of this shape, but I don't want to get that double shadowing. Which is a little less obvious because we've turned up the directionality of this light. If I put it back down, we can get that double shadow more clearly. It does cause some problems as we saw, because our deepest shadow, the secluded area, when we turn off shadows, now the light is filling in the shadow from the other light. So something to be aware of. It's better in most cases to try to minimize this as much as possible. So we would do that with where the light is placed in the scene so that we're kind of avoiding this or also balancing the ratios between the intensities. And that's something we can look at. Sampling, I don't think you'll need to use this, but you do have this option for the cutoff threshold. So what this controls is how much light is allowed to be in the scene before V-Ray will stop rendering additional lights. It's just kind of like an optimization tool. Object display. Here's where you have your stuff like primary visibility. If you mess with this, it turns it off completely. So it's kind of the same as doing like your enable or hide. And then a lot of this other stuff probably isn't going to be too useful to you, but you can always look it up in the documentation if you need to. 
but a lot of the parameters are similar to other objects in Maya. Okay. So another thing I wanted to talk about is how things like the shape of the light here, the size affects intensity and also the quality of the light. Something that's different between like studio photography and film lighting is that the, the lights can be different sizes with continuous light. You'll have all different sizes of like LED lights that they use to light scenes. And those lights will have different qualities. Larger lights are softer, generally speaking, and more intense depending on where they're positioned in relation to the object. And we'll take a look at what that looks like. With studio lights, they're all the same size. And so when you need a larger light, light source, you might be saying, well, like, how do you do that, right? If all of the lights are the same size and all you can vary is the intensity, right? Then how you achieve different looks of light? Uh, we do that with the modifiers. And so something like a soft box is used to increase the area of the light. And this is where that directionality comes in that we were talking about, because as you corral that light inside, you're also increasing the intensity. So what you lose by making the light larger, you kind of gain back from the directionality. Same thing with an umbrella. I think like the largest umbrella I have is um, a seven foot parabolic. So you can get like very large umbrellas to extend the the size of the light for you and this changes the quality so a lot of these parameters that we have are emulating things that we would do in real life with a type of modifier and we can take a look at those so i have the key light i also have this key light that i've called soft and you'll see it's much larger so our intensity here is the same Yes. Okay. So let's take a look at how this looks in the IPR. And I'm going to give you a second to kind of guess what's going to happen. So we have a large light source, same intensity, much brighter. And you may have guessed that. For me, I think if I didn't know, I would assume that it would be less bright, right? Because it's the same intensity and it's spread over a larger area. But this is one of those things where distance and size of the light source, like the distance relative to the object and the light source control the intensity of the light. What's happening here is because the light source is so close, more of that light is getting back to us. You also have less indirect light in the scene. So we're getting less of the light from the small light source spilling out everywhere and taking a while to get back to that object as it's bouncing around things. This light technically, because it's larger and close, is more directional. The other thing that I want you to take a look at is how the quality of the light hasn't really changed, but is a little bit different. So in our small light, let's bring that back. I'm gonna bring down this guy. We have this, but I want to bring up the directionality. Not of our key, not of our soft light, of this guy. Okay, so notice when we bring up the directionality of this light, the light is a bit harder. And so when I talk about hard versus soft lighting, there's a few things that define that. Hard light tends to have hard edges on the shadows, a lot of contrast between the shadow and the highlight. So we have less information, both in the highlights and in the shadows. So the shadow is really dark. We can't, if there was a texture or something applied to this plane, we wouldn't be able to see it here. And similarly in the highlight, a lot of those highs would be blended together because it's so bright. So these are qualities of harder light. This isn't like the hardest light, uh, because of the way it's set up with the directionality and the size and the distance to the object, it's giving us more of a slightly soft, like high contrast light. But these are some features of that. With the large light, it's much softer. So you see the edge on this shadow is very soft. 
there's less contrast between the highlights and the shadow. We get this really even transition. So that's some of the qualities of soft light. And soft light generally is something that we use for portraiture. Right? It tends to be more flattering. Generally for women, is used, they tend to use harder light sources on male models because hard light kind of accentuates angularity in the face, so we find that more flattering for men. So you will see this a lot. Now, outdoors, this is something I want to show you real quick. Outdoors and in direct sunlight, the quality of the light is very hard. And you may ask yourself, why? Why is that? The sun is huge, right? You would think, well, we just looked at it. A large light source creates soft light, right? The issue, though, is that the sun relative to us is very small in the sky. So it ends up being a small, very intense, very directional light source. So it seems a little counterintuitive, but you will notice that most times of the day, sunlight is very hard. And so I put together these images so we can take a look. And you can see those signs. We have very hard edges on our shadows, very high contrast between light and dark. We're getting these specular highlights. Same here, very hard shadows, right? Very high contrast between shadow and highlight. We're even losing information in these highlights because the sun is so intense. Here, this is probably at like one or two in the afternoon, which is one of the times where the sun is at its most intense in the sky. Right, we generally want to avoid sun between like noon and four o'clock. Here, this is a great example, right, where we have these very hard shadows, even in the shade, right, we're getting hard shadows everywhere. And we're also getting some bounce light. So this is a situation where the contrast might be a little bit lower between our highlights and our shadow areas because of more light coming in. This is a good example uh, for when we're identifying light sources. And then I pulled together some other ones too, just to talk about soft light and indirect light. You'll notice here, it's very hard to find the edges of the shadows, right? They kind of blend in to the other tones. Our specular highlights are much softer. Here we have some sunlight, but because we're kind of indirect, it's not directly over, we're getting softer shadows. It's an example of like high contrast, but soft. This woman is in indirect light. So very little contrast between the highlights, the midtones, and the shadows. Very, very soft shadows. This is supposed to be an example of hard versus soft light. Uh, this light isn't super soft. So it's softer, but still pretty high contrast. I guess it could work for this. And this would be a very hard light. You can just see how much more like striking the light is here. So even though both light sources are diffuse, which we'll talk about, so you're not getting high specularity, you can kind of still tell just from the way that the light is behaving and the contrast. This is a good example of soft natural light. So this would be like coming through a window where it's a bit indirect so very soft shadows, very soft highlights. So when we adjust this parameter, when we're looking specifically at the size of the light source, we're acting kind of like a soft box. And in a studio setting, when we want soft light, we always have it like very close to the subject. Generally within like three to six feet is a good range. And so you can kind of take that as like a rule of thumb, you know. I just kind of eyeball it, but I'm like, yeah, we'd be about here. Now we can change the quality of this light by changing how close it is. If I bring this way back, we're going to get something closer 
to our original key light. So I want to show you this so we can see how distance, you know, affects the subject. So soft light, key light. I probably bring the soft light back a little bit more. So you can see just that one parameter, just the distance changes things. The reason for that is if we go kind of to the perspective of our sphere, now this light is relatively close to the size of this one if we were in perspective. So they have the same intensities, but now this size relative to the object is getting closer to this size relative to the object. So that's why distance also impacts the quality of the light. So now that we're talking about soft light, we also have to talk about diffusion. Diffusion and directionality are kind of sisters, and they often work together but not always. And you'll hear a lot of people talk about soft light as diffuse light, but they aren't always the same thing. So let's take a look at kind of what I mean with diffusion. So diffusion is achieved when we use some kind of scrim-like material, like on a soft box. It's like a translucent white material kind of like this diffusion fabric here. And it helps to soften the light by reducing the amount of light, but also spreading it across the surface of the fabric. And the easiest way to see this in real life is on like an overcast day. So we had talked about how sunlight is hard, right? Sunlight, just the quality of sunlight is hard Closer to sunrise and sunset, it's going to be more diffuse. More of the light's going to be hidden. It's going to be a little softer. It's also diffuse on cloudy days. When you have a cloud cover in between the sun and like where we are, right? Everything on the surface, the light enters the cloud and bounces around inside of it, illuminating the whole cloud. So some of that light is reflected back into the atmosphere. So we lose some light, which is a quality of diffusion in general. We lose, I think, about a third of the light. But it also is turning that whole cloud into a light source. And so when it's very overcast or very cloudy, you're creating a giant light source now, which is similar to what we were looking at with our difference in lights here, right? So now the light's getting very soft because it's coming from a larger area. The whole sky is a light in that sense, instead of like the tiny dot of the sun where we normally get the light from. It's the same concept with diffusion. And just like on an overcast day, you get qualities of light like this where everything is very matte. You don't really have these specular highlights. Everything is very, very soft. And that's why I was saying here, you have soft and hard light is how this image was set up, but both are diffuse. So it can be harder to identify which light source is which because you don't have that telltale sign to give you. And oftentimes we layer types of lights to get the correct look. That's why I included in here beauty dishes and magnums because these are similar in shaping light um, and used a lot in portraiture work to a softbox or an umbrella where they are spreading the light over a larger area, but the shape of these is slightly different, like the parabolic shape is different from an umbrella or a softbox. So it shapes the light differently. Also the reflective material 
silver is going to give you much higher contrast because it's a, a harsher light, whereas the white is going to give you a bit of a softer effect. And then, of course, if you also use a diffusion fabric, we'll come back to honeycombs. But we often use these in conjunction. So we get a general soft light with the beauty dish. And then we'll use the magnum to bring up the highlights and specularity in the skin to give us a bit more contrast without uh, the light looking too harsh. And I've kind of set up an example of that. So we can take a look at our key light and then I have our magnum light here. So with just our key light, we have this look. Right? which isn't bad. But say I want a little higher highlight in here. I want a little more contrast in the shadow, but I don't want the scene to be too bright. Something I can do is use a second light, like this one, something very directional where the light is very controlled. And you can see already what that's doing. It's still giving me the quality of a soft light, but I'm getting a lot more contrast in the shadows, getting more bounce light here in my reflection. I, I just have a better overall look that's giving me a more defined shape. And we can take a look at the parameters of this light. So what are some things I'm doing with it? I'm shaping the light smaller. So I have a smaller light source. It's very directional. So I'm controlling where that light is falling. I could actually probably go up a little bit higher with that. A bit too high. And see, we can really control the look of the highlight and how much contrast we want just by controlling the directionality. The intensity is set down quite a bit. This is a little higher than it, it would if you were working just based off of the ratio. So I set it to a little more than a third. Um, a third the intensity of the other light would actually be 7.5. We'll talk about why that is when I talk about fill lights. But you can see layering lights, using lights together, we can recreate the look of some of these light modifiers that we have in real life that we don't necessarily have access to in the parameters of the light itself. Like we don't have a way to control diffusion. The only way that we can really work with that is by changing the size of the light itself. It's going to give us something close to diffusion without true diffusion. Something that we also use with large light sources when we're trying to diffuse light, you get a lot of spill with that that's less controlled. And so sometimes you want to increase the contrast and you would do that with something uh, called a grid or a honeycomb, honeycomb grid even. And this is a particular type of modifier that's used in conjunction with another modifier. It gives a little bit more directionality to the light but not as strong as something like a barn door. So it just, it helps shape it a little bit and increase the contrast slightly. In CG, you're not going to see much of a difference using this, but we can take a look. So how we would achieve that is down here under the texture options, I have checked on use rect text. And so here we can use a texture. It's really like a square texture, but a rectangular texture. In this section, I can add something to this node. I'm going to use a grid. And now we want to invert these colors. And you'll see it's not going to give us much. It hasn't changed really, really anything if we disconnect this. You know, the quality of the light is pretty much the same in this sense. 
in real life, it gives you a little bit more control. It kind of reduces the spill of the light a bit. But that doesn't mean that this isn't completely useless for us. We can do some pretty cool things with it. Let's turn off our honeycomb light. And I'm going to bring on this one that I have called shutter light. And so what I've done here is the same thing. It's pretty high directional. And then I've added a grid in the rectangle texture. Flipped the colors and I've just reduced one of these down. I've taken the U down so I have this shutter look. So this is a great way to achieve that if you have something where you have light coming through a window right, and you don't have actual shutters in the scene. You know, this is a much cheaper uh, option for rendering that. Some other cool things we can do, as I'm sure you're thinking, is we can we can add like a color texture to it and get something like this. So here I've added a stained glass pattern. And you can see the directionality really impacts how much of the texture we're able to see. I'm going to bring the intensity down. So I can start to get something like this pretty easily just by using a texture. And this will render a lot faster than shining light through like a refractive object, right? Like we learned in LookDev, light passing through refractive services is very expensive to render. So even though V-Ray works really well with lights and is optimized to that end, little tricks like this can be better options for you. Let's see if I can get a little more color in there. Yeah, so again, because we have that directionality on, unless you are trying to get a really blown out look, we really need to like scale down the intensity. I would even probably put this to something lower. Yeah, so we can get like a really interesting look with things like this. Another thing I wanted to talk about while we're talking about kind of the real world and the way light behaves. I'm going to put our key light back on, just our like standard light that we've been working with this whole time. Bounce light. So something you'll notice is after you've set up all of your lights in your proxy scene and you get your light looking really good, likely what you'll run into is that when you add all of your materials into the scene, the lighting is going to be too dark or too bright, probably too dark. And the reason for that is bounce light. So we talked a little bit about bounce light when I was showing our examples of sunlight. But this is also another type of indirect light, right? It's literally what it says, light bouncing off of another surface, and it bounces off of everything we can see when we're outside, right? But also indoors, there's light bouncing off of everything, and then coming back. When the light bounces off of objects, it loses some of its intensity because not all of that light is coming back at the same angle. Some of it's going that way, some of it's going that way, right? It'll miss the object. And so there's always this kind of ratio between the two that we can replicate when we're working with our own light. But we can take a look at how that works in real life where we would have something like a reflector, which is very common in studio photography to fill in some of the shadows. And we use this specifically because it's easier in real life and kind of cheaper from the standpoint of the equipment um, and using electricity to just redirect light that's already in the space. And with that, you can see we're getting a little bit of fill here. If I were to shut that off, shadow is darker. So we can see the light's coming from the source. It's going out in all directions, right? 180 degrees. So some of that light is hitting here. It's bouncing here. Some of it's 
hitting down here, bouncing back. And so this is helping to direct some of that light back in. And we have different types of reflectors. This one is a white reflector. This just has a basic white material on it, similar to like a foam core that you would use for studio photography. I also have a black reflector. This isn't doing much for us in CG because of the way lighting works. In real life, because this absorbs a lot of the light that's hitting it, it's going to deepen the shadow. So this is what you use to like deaden the bounce light when you want less of it. But you can see here, it really is no different. Having nothing there at all. But something like this, that's metallic, is going to give us a brighter highlight with more contrast. Now we use metallic reflectors a lot of time outdoors, like gold and silver ones, depending on how you want to um, color the light or if you need a lot of light back in. So you can see how much light we're getting off of that surface. One of the reasons though, that I wouldn't recommend this, like using this specific technique to shape the light in the scene is it's more expensive. The way that V-Ray is set up to work with lighting, it's almost double as long, at least in my experiment, to use this piece of geometry to redirect the light. And so for it to render those secondary bounces, then it is just to put a new light source in. And so how I would approach that is with a fill light, which is another common technique in photography where you would just take a second light at a lower power to shine some light in here. And it's usually very directional because we want to control where that's falling in the scene. So you'll see I made this just tall rectangular light. It's directional. The power is very low to get the appropriate look. Generally, the ratio, I think I may have mentioned this, between the key light and a fill light would be this fill light would be one third the power of the key light to start and then you would just kind of like bring that down or dial it in as you need to but generally that gets you in the right range with working with lights and cg it seems like that's not quite accurate like any of the ratios that you learn from photography are just not accurate uh, but it's a good starting place right you can start there and then kind of like dial things down because at least you have an idea of where you should be you can save yourself just a tiny bit of time but in order to understand those ratios, we probably have to talk about stops of light and how light is measured in photography. But one way that we measure lights when we're working with studio lights is in stops of light. And it's related to the f-stop of the camera, which is a ratio of like the focal length to how dilated the aperture in the lens is. Each f-stop is half as much light as the previous stop. So when we talk about ratios of light, if you were to look them up, right, which there's a lot of information out there for this, we'd have to look at something like, as I was saying, where the fill light is one third of this key light. And you would think, oh, well, it's at 30, so one third is going to be 10. And that's that wouldn't be accurate because you're going by stops, right? So you have to kind of have the number and have it again. So it would actually be like 7.5, 7.5 twice, right? It would be 15 and then you have 30. So 7.5 is one third the amount of light. And again, it's going to get you to a good place if the other factors of the light are the same. So the directionality of the light is the same if the size of the lights are the same then that ratio should be accurate. But in situations like this, where we have different directionality and different sizes, I would use that as a starting place and then kind of dial that in as you need it to get the right look. But you can see here with the second light, we were able to get essentially the same look as reflecting light back in with a metallic light source or a metallic reflector to get that bounce light. But this is going to render in the same amount of time or close to it as a single light because of the way V-Ray works. Whereas using the reflector bouncing light back in physically that way is going to take more time. But I wanted to show you 
how reflectors work and the bounce light in this scene to show you that in this setup with very light materials that are going to be very reflective and bouncing light all over, your lighting's going to look a lot brighter in your proxy than it is in your final scene. When you start to bring materials in and you have colors and changes in roughness and subsurface or whatever you're using, that's going to change the way that the light is behaving in the scene and you will need to readjust all of your intensities to match that. So just something to be aware of because I know like my first time lighting a scene, I was like, what is happening? I thought it was like so perfect and then I had to do so much work. Even on my Blackberry Hunter one, I was like, oh, I got the lighting perfect. And then I had to redo everything. But at least all your lights are in the scene when you set it up first, right? At your kind of like lock-in stage. Everything's there. The ratios of the lights are already set. So you just have to increase one and then make your adjustments to the rest. That's why I like to work that way. One last thing I want to show you is this guy. So I have this piece of geometry here. You may run into situations where you do need to use something to shape the light in a way that you can't get it done with either a texture in the light source or changing the various parameters of the light. And that happened to me in my Blackberry Hunter project where I had a lot of spill light coming in in an area where I didn't need it. And I had to figure out a solution for shaping that light, for essentially blocking it out. And I did exactly this. I put a plane in to block the path of the light. As we can see, I have it right in front of this light. So we're getting this light coming through, but this whole section of the light is being blocked. And we can see that on the sphere. Right now, I have the plane visible. This is a little weird. So in order to turn off the visibility of this in the render, you actually have to go under the Arnold tab in the shape options. So not the transform node, the shape here. Go down to Arnold, it'll open for me. And then we wanna turn off primary visibility. And that's going to hide the mesh in the render. I'm not sure why it works in V-Ray too. It must just be the way that things are set up in Maya, but you will find it under the Arnold tab. Uh, there isn't like an option for this that I could find in V-Ray, but this works. So this is another way that you can shape light in your scene using geometry and just be aware. Yeah, it's going to be a little heavier, but you may run into situations where you need to do this. There's just a few caveats with using the photometric light, the IES, that I want to talk about really quickly. So the information is baked into that data file. So you don't have a whole lot of control over the look of the light. It's going to be pretty consistent. You'll see here I've switched on soft shadows and the shadow options because Regardless of how you adjust the size or intensity of the light, you're going to still get the same quality of shadow because that is within the data file. So they gave us some extra tools here to control the look of that, to get a kind of softer look to your light. So this is something just to know if you're going to be working with these types of lights. You can also adjust the shadow color. And this is something in all of the lights, we can change this to get a more artistic look. So if you have something that's in more of an NPR style, like a non-photo reel, or it's just a little more like artistic, you have like very cool shadows made with like a violet tinge, Let's do ourselves something like that. And we can maybe turn down the intensity and make this a bit darker. So. You know, we can get something like that using the shadow color. That's an important parameter to know about. And then again, you still have these channels and pretty much everything else is the same. The only other thing I'm going to show you 
is where you can find these. So I know I had this up earlier, but I just want to show you one more time. This is ieslibrary.com. And from here, it's similar to like Holly Haven and HDRI Haven, right? So it's like all of this is free. You can go and find any of the files that you need and try them out. And then if you want to donate, of course you can donate as well. But check this out if you're looking to use those. This is where you can find IES files to use in your projects. All right, so that does it for this one. In the next video, I'm going to do a real-time demo matching the lighting from a reference image in a scene. So I will catch you there.